As I mentioned in the previous lecture, burning hydrogen produces energy in the form of heat. You can convert this heat to electricity in a steam turbine. However, in a car, we would rather use a fuel cell. A fuel cell converts hydrogen and oxygen into electricity in a single step. Moreover, unlike a steam turbine, the conversion into electricity may take place at relatively low temperatures and it does not involve any mechanical element. So let us go through the different parts of the fuel cell. The fuel cell consists of two porous catalytic electrodes separated by a so-called proton exchange membrane. This is a polymer which is able to conduct protons. On the left, hydrogen gas enters the fuel cell. Hydrogen is split into protons and electrons at the catalyst. Only the protons can pass through the membrane so the electrons are forced to go through the electrical circuit outside of the fuel cell. This in fact provides the electrical power. At the right hand side, oxygen enters the fuel cell in the form of air. This oxygen recombines with the protons that have diffused through the membrane and the electrons from the external circuit to form water. The formation of water provides the driving force for this reaction. In order to understand the amount of power the fuel cell delivers, we will now take a look at the inside of the fuel cell in more detail. The formation of water actually consists of two steps. In the first step, the hydrogen molecule is broken up into two protons and two electrons. In the second step, the protons recombine with oxygen to form the water molecule. For each of the molecules of water formed, two electrons passed through the external circuit. Now we can answer the question, how much energy do we get out of such a fuel cell? The maximum electrical power is determined by the so-called Gibbs free energy of the reaction. The Gibbs free energy reflects the driving force behind a chemical reaction. It describes the energy associated with a chemical reaction that can be used for work. For the reaction to form water from hydrogen and oxygen, the Gibbs free energy is 180.5 megajoules per kilogram of hydrogen. From the electrical work, we can calculate the potential of a fuel cell by dividing the Gibbs free energy by the amount of electrical charge that was transferred for this reaction to take place. In this way, we find that the maximum potential of this fuel cell is 1.23 volts. However, in practice, this is not what we observe because the 1.23 volt potential is only found at zero current. When we increase the current, the potential decreases due to various loss mechanisms. Broadly speaking, they are due to the electrical resistance at the electrodes and within the cells. The losses generate heat and in general the output potential is only 0.6 volt, implying an efficiency of the fuel cell of around 50%. Now, hydrogen, which we used in the fuel cell, is not a resource. We cannot mine it like a fossil fuel. Hence, we have to consider how to make hydrogen from sustainable sources. And in fact, hydrogen can be made in many, many different ways. However, without going into much detail, the most straightforward way to produce hydrogen is from electrolysis. Electrolysis is a pretty old but reliable technology. And for instance, this electrolyzer plant was already operated in 1948 and produced hydrogen on a large scale. The only reason that this Norwegian electrolyzer is not in function anymore is due to cost considerations. Hydrogen produced from natural gas costs roughly one euro per kilogram, almost a factor 10 less than by electrolysis using this kind of system. Here in this calculation, of course, the external cost implied by the CO2 emission are not taken into account. 
Hence, to facilitate now a sustainable production of hydrogen, interest in this electrolysis process has revived. So, how does electrolysis work? In fact, electrolysis is the reverse of the fuel cell process. Here, electricity provides the energy needed to split water in hydrogen and oxygen. Again, we have two electrodes, the positive cathode and the negative anode. In this case, the electrodes are placed in a water bath that can be both acidic and alkaline. By applying a potential, we will generate hydrogen at the cathode and oxygen at the anode. The chemical reactions involved in this process are the reverse of those in a fuel cell. At the cathode, oxygen is formed with the simultaneous release of protons and electrons. The protons move to the other compartment to form hydrogen at the other side. The total reaction is then just simply the reverse of the reaction in a fuel cell. And in the ideal case, one would therefore expect the electrical potential required for water splitting to be 1.23 volt, the reverse of what we get as the maximum potential of a fuel cell. However, in practice, we need a much higher potential of around 1.75 volt to generate enough current. So the efficiency to convert electricity to hydrogen is around 70%. That is the uh, ratio between 1.23 and 1.75. So in summary, we have seen that we can store energy in chemical bonds. The most simple molecule, hydrogen, allows us to design a closed loop of storage and conversion. Hydrogen can be produced by electrolysis using PV or wind-generated electricity. While the oxygen can be stored in the atmosphere, the hydrogen can be stored locally for very long times, which is an enormous advantage as compared to batteries. To retrieve the stored energy, we recombine the hydrogen with oxygen from the atmosphere to produce electricity by using a fuel cell. However, we observe substantial losses in the conversion cycle. As you remember, the efficiency of water electrolysis was 70%, and the efficiency of the fuel cell is only 50%. This means that there is an energy loss of 65% in the whole hydrogen cycle. This is, of course, a big disadvantage as compared to batteries. <coughs> if we want to use energy in an efficient way, we should use batteries or any other electrical storage device uh, for storage whenever possible. Their cycle efficiency is much higher than for chemical storage. However, the cost, size and volatility of electrical storage are sometimes prohibitive. And then storage in chemical bonds becomes an option. Chemicals can be stored for a long period of time. However, the problem of the low cycle efficiency has not yet been solved. <laughs>